the prom center, mid-continent of the United States. Stan Kenton has been on stand for the past three hours. And it's great to look out across that audience and see the tremendous cross-section. And what comes to mind immediately is the age of rock and its impact on the Kenton band. Uh, is the jazz-rock fusion an important consideration? Well, I think it's something that came about, but you remember that there's a lot of difference between what we play today, what the bands are playing today, that's called a fusion from the original forms of rock music, because that was a very crude form of music. But the more sophisticated forms of rock have joined jazz, and jazz has joined uh, them. But not all music is that way. You still have pure jazz, and you still have pure rock. How have the audiences changed, or have they changed, since the days of Balboa Beach now? Oh, it's been a long time, but they've changed a lot. It's, uh, it, in those days, it was all strictly dancing. Today, it's mostly all concerts for those of us in jazz. I looked out there, and I saw gentlemen from the age of 70 to young ladies uh, the age of nine out of there in the audience. Is jazz a family affair, better than family viewing, in quotes, as television calls it? Well, I think the last couple of three years, jazz has become more of a family affair because uh, the young people, I think, for a long time were bound and determined not to like jazz because their parents liked it and they were, they were pretty certain they weren't going to like anything that their parents liked. But since they have been exposed to big band jazz, live jazz, they've changed their thinking a great deal. And uh, we have, a lot of times in concerts, full families coming and enjoying it. And that is really uh, a kind of a, a relationship family viewing and jazz. Yes, that's about it. Stan, in programming, I keep hearing Debussy lurking around the corner in Stravinsky. Is that true? Oh, I don't know. If, if it is, it's coincidental. We don't make a practice of copying Stravinsky or Debussy or Ravel. I don't think that you can say that we do. On another subject entirely, last year a giant passed away by the name of Duke Ellington. Your view of his contributions. Well, I don't think you even have to ask my view of his contributions. They're the same as everyone else is aware of. Duke was uh, an exceptional person. He was born into a family of means. He didn't scrounge like many of the musicians did. He, uh, his family was for him from the time he was born. He had the best of everything. He was gifted with a great talent for music. He was gifted with a brilliant mind. God even made him handsome. So I think the greatest thing that can be said about Duke, Duke was truly royalty. Stan, one other uh, view of things. The World Jazz Association came into being in Los Angeles, California in April of 1975 at the Sheraton Universal with about 85 people present, including Bob Kerno of your organization. And your view of that, uh, that new professional trade organization and its possibilities. I don't know what to say, Lay. It's nice that, the, that, those, that many people got together that are concerned over jazz, but I'm not sure that the World Jazz Association is going to be able to swing something that hasn't been swung before in jazz. Because today, it's quite different than it used to be. The radio used to be a creative thing. Today, it's not a creative thing anymore. It's a format, auto, format automated thing. And radio's desire is to reach most of the people most of the time. That means catering to mass tastes as this television does, and jazz is anything but music for the masses, because it has to do with a sophisticated minority. And uh, so, that's all right, come in, you guys. Just be quiet. Uh, so I hope the World Jazz Association is, is be able to do something, uh, but, and I'm not gonna be negative about it, let's just keep our fingers crossed. One other thought. The artist, the performer in the recording industry has certainly had a tremendous time trying to collect royalties and uh, for his performances particularly. I know you've been an ardent campaigner in behalf of a performance royalty in the new copyright law. Um, first of all, maybe uh, just a consideration for that point of view and then its chances of survival in the legislature. There has been no legislature so far to affect the copyright laws, even after all the things that have gone on the last few years with everybody pushing and and trying to enlighten people in Washington, the legislatures, as to what, to go, is what is going on. The copyright laws haven't been changed since 1909, and to fool with them is like rewriting the Bible. And uh, none of us have be able to, been able to crack the, 
the sound barrier yet with them. I don't know how soon it's going to happen. Many of those legislators are very naive and they don't understand anything about what's going on because the copyright legislation is kind of complex. But it would be nice if we could get legislation passed so that artists could be compensated when their records are used for profit. Because in jukeboxes, for instance, as long as we've had jukeboxes around, they don't pay anybody anything. They don't pay the composer anything. They don't pay the artist anything, the record companies anything. They don't pay BMI, ASCAP anything. They've had a free ride for years and years and years, and it's unfair. Stan, a final after this long night. What's the future direction of jazz as far as you see it? Nobody knows, Lee. If anybody boasts that they've got a crystal ball, they're nuts. Do you think the future technologies, such as uh, perhaps uh, new forms of cable television broadcasting and uh, video disc uh, have any import for the jazz musician? I don't know about that. At least uh, cable television might eventually give people a choice so they don't have to sit and watch commercial television the way it is today because commercial television is probably a pretty rank form of entertainment. If people did have a choice and demand jazz, the minority, then I'm sure they'd get it if they had cable television. Do you care to recap your comments about country music in Nashville? No, I don't think I have to recap it. It's just that I, I think that what goes on in Nashville, as I said before, is a kind of a national disgrace because they make it a business of catering to the lower forms of human taste in order to popularize their music. And to me, it's a cold, calculated uh, scheme of things that has nothing to do with the culture or artistic creativity. Stan Kenton, you're very gracious. Thanks very much for being forthright and straight head on. Thank you, Lee. It's nice to see you again. Good luck. Really a pleasure to see you and always to hear you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. I'm not going to go